Hey everyone, it's Tim from Lanessa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today. Today we are continuing our series on genetics, talking about line breeding, inbreeding, and hybrid vigor. Stay tuned to find out more. All right, so today again we're talking about line breeding, inbreeding, and hybrid vigor. So kind of on the scale of breeding, uh, we kind of go from one, one extreme to the other. Um, on this end of the spectrum, we would have inbreeding. That would be way down here. Uh, probably down somewhere in here, we would have line breeding. This is just our average run of the day, you know, breeding by, um, this would be like breeding by um, class or breed specific. Right in here would be um, this would be kind of breeding different classes in your area or breeding, we'll say similar classes. Um, so in this case, we'd be talking about maybe like a, um, an Ile de France and a pulled dorset. To the untrained eye, uh, these are, are pretty similar. Just saying, you know, same color nose, same colored hooves, same colored face. So that would be kind of in the realm of breeding with similar classes there. They have different genetic profiles, but very, very similar uh, attributes about them. And then way down here, this is where we really get hard and heavy into the, uh, what we call the hybrid, hybrid vigor. And we're, we're going to talk today about this one right here, this one right here, and then this one right here. Uh, so again, the inbreeding, the line breeding, and the hybrid vigor and what they are, what they mean, why they're important to understand, especially on your small farm. Uh, this video is made primarily um, to address the issue of line breeding. I want you all to understand what line breeding is because as customers, I know a lot of you are gonna go to people's farms um, and you're gonna ask them about different genetics and they're gonna kind of throw off the cuff. They're gonna be like, oh, well, we line breed. Um, and what they really mean to say is they inbreed, but inbreeding sounds bad. So they're going to tell you that they line breed. So again, uh, I just wanted to, we'll write those down in here. So inbreeding uh, line breeding. And then on the other end, again, the hybrid vigor. Um, so again, in the case of genetics, just as a refresher, if you haven't watched our genetic video um, on recessive and dominant traits right here, I want you to check that out. Uh, please watch that now before you continue this video, you're not gonna understand. So to refresh your memory really quick, in the case of recessive genes, We'll use blue eyes and brown eyes uh, as an example. I'm actually gonna use a couple different markers here to make it even easier. Um, so in one case, we have a parent with uh, brown eyes, and in the other case, we have a parent with blue eyes. Blue eyes are recessive. So we're gonna draw our Punnett square here. And then we're going to say uh, this parent also carries the recessive. So we have parent one and we have parent number two. And in this case, we're going to have, it's going to look like this. Mm. 
this child and this child are going to have brown eyes because remember that dominant brown masks the recessive blue but in this case uh, this child uh, child three and child four are both going to have blue eyes because again that recessive gene and these recessive genes have to show themselves in order to manifest um, and so we've got our genotype and our phenotype again that phenotype in order to see those blue eyes you have to have two recessives come together otherwise they're masked um, and again just real quick just to refresh your memory so we run into things where you can't see it but it's there so someone may tell you well you can't have two brown-eyed parents that have a blue-eyed baby um, and again that's just not true um, because again if you have carriers of that recessive gene should have done it this way but in two brown-eyed parents brown-eyed and brown-eyed parents that carry the recessive gene you have a 25 percent chance that that baby is going to have blue eyes um, so again what you see isn't always what you get and that's what we want to talk about about the dangers of inbreeding. So in the danger of inbreeding, I'm gonna change my color to red because I, I think of red as kind of like the bad color um, and not necessarily that it is a bad color, but we're gonna make it a bad color today. So let's assume in the case of inbreeding that we have uh, parent one and we'll just use uh, We'll just use what would be easiest. We'll use a capital B and a little b. We'll assume that that little b is a bad recessive gene. Eh, let's do it this way. We'll assume that that little b is a bad recessive gene. So we'll say this is dad and this is mom. And now we're going to breed these two together. So you see in this case, you've got a 50% chance that one of those offspring is going to be a carrier of that bad recessive gene. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you're going to see it because it's buried underneath that dominant gene, but they're a carrier. Maybe you'll get lucky and they won't, but uh, there's a 50% chance that they will. So now what you run into is, is quite, it's, it's really quite simple. It's this. So now we decided we're going to take one of those babies because they looked really good and we liked them. And we're going to breed them back into the same dad. Now what happens? Well, now you've got a 75% chance that that baby is going to carry that gene and a 25% chance that that recessive gene is going to rear its ugly head. Um, and this can be all kinds of genetic ailments. This can be uh, dwarfism. Uh, this can be spider gene. This can be scrapie. This can, and the list goes on and on and on. These are all recessive genes. Every single one of these is a recessive gene. <laughs> And so what you run into is you run into someone's a carrier and you start backbreeding and eventually it comes up and it bites you in the rear end and you end up with one of those babies that is a carrier. So what is the, what is the answer? What's the, what's the best way to deal with this? Well, 
This is where I want you to understand the difference between line breeding and inbreeding. So in the case of line breeding, and what really separates the line breeding and the inbreeding is this. You'll generally start off with multiple rams uh, of a very specific class, um, and it's something that they really, really like. So when you think of certain breeds of dogs where they really, really breed them hard for that very, very specific uh, genetic type of traits, um, that's not even line breeding. What line breeding is, is a very specific breed, and then you have very specific characteristics about that very specific breed that you like, like length and height and whatever. Uh, let's say you have champion bloodlines, and so you keep breeding them back into one another uh, in order to, to maintain those genetics. So what the professionals will do in the case of line breeding is they know those dangers. They know what happens when you have uh, this because uh, they know eventually that that recessive gene is going to come back to bite them in the rear end. Now we're not going to get into the grand scheme of things, but normally in the case of line breeding, they'll have multiple fathers. Uh, their genetic profile will go through a bunch of ewes and then they'll kind of mix and match to uh, keep uh, fathers from breeding on daughters and things like that. So they're, they're using cousins maybe if they have to, to breed back. But again, they know the dangers of this. So how do they get around that? Very easily. Genetic testing. This is the difference with professionals that line breed. I'm not a fan of line breeding. I understand it. But what I'm telling you is these people spend the money to get the blood work done to check for all of those uh, recessive genetic traits that we were just talking about. And they know if mom or dad is a carrier of that gene. And if they have it, they get rid of them. They don't have them in their flock. They have a close, what is called a closed flock. And what a closed flock is, is a flock that has been genetically tested for any of these negative recessive genes and they have eliminated that from their flock and they don't let anything new come into that flock. Any new genetics come into that flock. Um, most people won't let any come in at all. And if they are going to let someone come in, uh, what they're going to do is they're going to heavily uh, blood test that animal to make sure that it's not a carrier of any of those recessive genes that they don't like. So when you go to someone's farm and they, you see that they're breeding in like fathers with daughters, um, uh, fathers with cousins, things like that, and they tell you their line breeding, I want you to remember, did they genetically test and do they have a closed flock? If they've done both of these, um, usually line breeders will still won't be breeding fathers on daughters. All right, so the last thing we wanna talk about is hybrid vigor. Um, and what is hybrid vigor? Well, hybrid vigor is when you get genetics um, of different animals that are, have been separated for so long um, that when they finally do come back together, you get something kind of brand new and you get the synergistic, we call it a synergistic effect, which is just like a, an amplified effect. You got lots of brand new genetics um, and you see a lot of increased growth potential and other positive attributes. So, excuse me, so what happens with hybrid vigor? You know, if we had to divide the United States up, um, and obviously I am aware of the fact that the United States is in a square, um, but we are very ge uh, geographically segregated. Um, and what you'll find uh, throughout the United States is even if you're breeding, I like to use pole dorsets because that's one of the breeds that we, we use, but let's say I'm breeding pole dorsets um, here in Indiana. And what we may find is, um, and what usually happens is, is you tend to breed um, and you tend to buy animals that are really segregated into your very, very small area. Um, the other thing that you may do is you may say, oh, I'm gonna go over here maybe to Iowa and I'm gonna pick up a ram and bring them back uh, to me, but it, then it just starts all over again. You've got, you've got these uh, genetic kind of uh, pools, if you will, throughout the United States, and they're all very, very different, very, very different genetics. Um, and that's just using one breed as an example. Um, the other thing that you'll, you'll see is when you have champion bloodlines, you have, um, 
you know, you've, you've all heard it before. Think of your breed or think of if you're goat people or, or sheep people or whatever. But let's say Tim has a, uh, Tim has a champion goat, uh, Tim's goat. And Tim's champion goat, we'll, we'll say his name's Scooter. And uh, Scooter uh, comes in number one at uh, Nationals. Um, and now everybody wants Scooter's genetics, right? So what are they going to do? Well, we're going to get a bunch of sperm from Scooter, and we're going to sell it to all these big breeders. And next thing you know, uh, Scooter's genetics are here and here and here, and then it all starts all over again. We're all breeding uh, Scooter's genetics into every flock everywhere because everybody wants them. And they tell you, oh, well, I, you know, this is from Scooter. That's one of the big selling points that they're going to tell you is, oh, well, the, our flock has Scooter genetics. Well, guess what? Your flock and half the other flocks in the United States have Scooter genetics in it. And so now what you end up with is you end up with the same problem that you had before. Ways to get around this. Um, you can go way out of out of your comfort zone, way across the United States to pick up different genetics. Um, another uh, example is is to breed from a completely different bloodline. Um, maybe you know uh, your neighbor has uh, a different breed class. Maybe they have black faced sheep and you have white faced sheep, and so you bring from his or her pool into yours and now you start adding some differences in there um, you're getting completely different genetics and you're bringing them back together and you're kind of um, recreating or bringing about something new um, the ultimate uh, for this would be um, you have a breeding pool that maybe no one has has dipped into in a very very long time uh, that may be located uh, somewhere way, way far away from you, and you bring that in, um, and you can go, you can go that route, and you can see some pretty, some pretty significant differences. What we're starting to see recently is we're starting to see um, uh, animals from the EU and from Australia um, that are actually. I apologize if that's not the correct. Uh, if I put down like Austria or something else, I'm probably gonna get beat up by some of our Australian viewers. But um, you're starting to see genetics that have been out of the US for so long that are now getting brought in and you're starting to see some really cool um, things happen. Uh, so the, uh, in this case, we'll use the pole, uh, pole dorset. The pole dorset uh, is starting to come in. We're starting to see pole dorset come in from uh, Australia as well, and they're getting they're getting bred in uh, here in the United States and kind of creating that kind of creating that hybrid vigor. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, we just covered inbreeding, line breeding, and hybrid vigor. Again, I want you to uh, remember as much as you possibly can about the line breeding. So if you go to somebody's farm. And they're telling you, oh, I'm not inbreeding, I'm line breeding. Um, I want you to ask uh, very specifically, you know, okay, what is it that, what is it that is going on here? Have you genetically tested? Do you have carriers? Um, ask the tough questions so you know you don't want to bring something back to your farm that is carrying one of those recessive genes uh, because you don't want to infect uh, your entire flock with, with those negative traits. All right. So I am Tim from Lanessa Farm, especially in Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today, and we look forward to seeing you again next time.